This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. I'm your host Duncan McLeish, welcome to the show. Up on this episode we are delivering our third part of a four part series counting down my top 20 horror movies of 2023. On this episode we do numbers 10 through 6. On Wednesday the final episode in the series will drop. I just managed to squeeze it in just in time for the end of of January. Like Indiana Jones grabbing his hat before the door slams shut, we will get this done and back to our regular scheduled content. Ladies and gents, I hope you've checked out the first two parts. I hope some of the titles have surprised you. I hope some of them have um, validated your lists. I hope there are some titles on there that you've never seen before or you've been waiting to check out and maybe I've given you the nudge to go and check it out. I hope that there is disagreement. I always love a bit of disagreement and if there, once again, if there is anything that is not on my list that you think I may have missed or should be checking out, please leave it in the comments on the Facebook group page, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash cast on the YouTube videos or anywhere else you can get in touch with me. So, the caveats, as always, at the start of these episodes are quite simple. The movies that appear on my list either were released in the UK in 2023, so if it didn't come out in your territory, I apologise. It was a screener submitted to me because I review movies, I get screeners from basically all over the world. So if it's been released in another territory but not in the UK in 2023, once again, I am sorry. And last but not least, if it played at a film festival and has not received distribution since, and I saw it in 2023, is also on my list. So, sorry about that as well. So without any further ado, ladies and gents, I'm bringing to you numbers 10 through 6 in my top 20 of 2023. In at number 10. Speak it with me now with hearts full of faith. Let him rise. Let him rise. Let him rise! 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 Number 10 on the list is Onyx the Fortuitous and the Talisman of Souls. It's written and directed by Andrew Bowser, who himself stars as the titular Onyx of Fortuitous. The synopsis of this movie, as listed on IMDb, is fledging occultist Onyx and a group of worshippers attend a -a once-in-a-lifetime ritual at their idols, Bartok the Great's mansion. So this played at Fright Fest, it did get a release about Halloween last year, so it did make it out before the end of the year, which I'm quite happy about because it was one I was talking quite fondly of. Now, I know this one has been slightly polarising in that some people genuinely don't get the humour in the movie. That's fine. Humour is subjective. Some people love it, some people loathe it, some people get with the programme, some people don't. Some people think a movie like... Terrifier is one of the best movies of the last 10 years and I think it's utter hot trash. So, see, opinions, it makes the world go round. For me, Onyx the Fortuitous was a incredibly well executed, very, very funny, very heart in the right place horror comedy. Kind of reminded me in a lot of ways that a movie like, and I always reference this one as kind of a benchmark for good modern horror comedies, but kind of reminded me a little bit of Tucker and Dale vs. Evil in that the attention to the horror aspect was actually handled with surprising grace considering 
the subject matter, and the humour worked alongside that. In the case of this movie here, it's kind of... It's kind of paying homage to the fantastical, and let's be honest about it, absurdities of kind of mid to late 80s action horror movies. Um, loud, bright, garish, over-the-top characters who are borderline annoying, borderline hilarious. Mishaps, misdeeds, misfortune, practical effects... In a lot of respects, this movie to me is kind of, it embodies the same kind of earnest delivery as a movie like Psycho Gorman, which is obviously made for, I think, quite a bit less than this. Um, but it's like similar sort of hearts in the right place and you kind of need to roll with it. Andrew Bowser has been playing the character of Onyx for what about now 10 years the internet satan guy he's been in tons of viral videos and i think his key is the delivery he has a particularly fast almost computer-like delivery of of dialogue which is at times very funny very whimsical and other at times kind of tragic and sad and when you get past that which i know a lot of people can't get past that you have a movie which is surrounded by an incredible cast including Jeffrey Combs and one of my favourite Jeffrey Combs performances of like the last decade Barbara Crampton who is not in it loads but she delivers the goods nonetheless um, Andrew Bowser himself playing a blinder alongside a great cast of kind of oddball characters um, the story will feel familiar it's not one that you've never seen before but the attention to the digital and practical effects, and when I say practical effects, I mean like full in with creature design, is kind of jaw dropping. It's the sort of movie that when it finishes, it kind of makes you think this must be, and I know I'm going to get some heat for this, but this must be what it must have been like going to see something like um, A Big Trouble in Little China and coming at the movie theatre going, what the fuck did I just watch? I've just seen martial arts and ghosts and superstition and black magic and action and Jack Burton um, all in a, in a movie which is hard to... It's hard to advertise and it's also kind of hard to articulate but you know it's going to have a cult following for you know, decades after. Onyx of Fortuitous is going to have a cult following for decades after. Whether it has the same cultural impact that a movie like Big Trouble in Little China has, time will tell on that one. Probably don't think it will because one's directed by John Carpenter. The other one is Andrew Bowser really doing his first proper feature. But the character himself and his, his kind of madcap journeys are one that I'm eager to kind of flow through with. It has one of my favourite kind of set piece to uh, a kind of... 80s pop song setups that I've maybe ever seen in a movie before and like I say I felt like all the way through it I could feel the movie's heart. It's very easy to make a horror comedy and for it to feel sterile, to feel as almost a, a box ticking exercise or a, a kind of snarky quick way to make money. There's loads of those movies out there but the ones to me that feel earnest and the ones that feel like the director themselves has a love and passion for the genre which wills out onto the the TV screen are the ones that stay with me the longest. And Onyx the Fortuitous is one such movie. Like I say, if you don't like it, I don't care. <laughs> this is my list. Give me your list. I will happily read it and if I disagree with any of those, we will agree to disagree. But number 10 on my list was Onyx the Fortuitous and the Talisman of Souls. In at number 9. At number 9 on my list is Skinnamarink. This one was written and directed by Kyle Edward Ball based on his short story of the same name. This one here is um, minimal cast, it's mostly voices, and the synopsis is two children wake up in the middle of the night to find their father is missing and all of the windows and doors in their home have vanished. 
So we might as well just come out with another polarising one. Why not? It is the top 10 after all. Skin and Marink, maybe above all the movies that made my kind of final list this year, was the one where almost every internet source was saying, if you see one movie, or if there's one movie guaranteed to terrify you, it's Skin and Marink. And I always feel a degree of scepticism whenever I hear that. I try and go in to see movies with as neutral a vibe as possible, unless it's one that I have like a, a heavy vested interest in. Franchise are a great example of that. You know, if I've connected with a franchise, I go into that franchise expecting a degree or a level of quality or not quality, depending on what the franchise is. But when movies are dubbed the scariest movie of the year, it's very difficult to feel any gravitas to that statement. And the initial backlash to Skin and Rink when it sh was shown on Shudder was quite evident. Now, this is one I got as a screener in advance of its release on Shudder, so I was already kind of slightly ahead of the curve on this one. And my opinion hasn't really changed about this movie. I think it is, it's difficult to call it a movie, and that's where I might get some kick back for what I'm about to say. Some horror films are movies. They have all the spectacle of a movie. They have weaving, you know, intricate plots. They have either likeable or unlikable characters. They have, you know, some sort of crux that is going to appear somewhere down the line that's going to be super important, whether it's the final girl, whether it's the you know, the, the ancient box that closes the door to the... Whatever it is, they all have a conceit that you need to kind of get your head round. Other horror movies are experience movies. You know, they're, they're there purely to deliver the experience. Now I know what you're thinking. Duncan, surely that works against what you've just said and to an extent. You're right, but to me, a movie like Climax, although it has a story, um, you know, weaves a narrative and has characters to an extent, even though you never really get any great detail and they do feel like two-dimensional kind of walking, talking cardboard cutouts that are about to get eviscerated. A movie like Climax is about the experience. It's about the cinematography. It's about the set design. Um, it's about, you know, camera angles. It's about soundtrack, score, um, kinetic energy like feelings of claustrophobia that you can't quite put your finger on. Skin and Marink is a, for all intents and purposes, an experience horror movie. It doesn't really have a plot, if we're being honest here, and it's hard to talk about acting. You don't really see any characters, you hear voices, but with the lights out and a good pair, good pair of headphones on, in the dark, on a big screen, it's difficult to argue that this movie isn't deeply unsettling. It takes a lot to get me going, to get me jumping in a horror movie. And I'll be honest, Skin and Rink deploys a lot of cheek tricks, a lot of kind of whisper, 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 and then a loud noise that comes over for a second or a distortion or a flicker or a movement. Um, the idea is kind of visually told through two children in a house with the lights off at night alone trying to find their dad. There's also clever it's kind of playing to that part of our lizard brain that remembers being small and being afraid of the dark it's just kind of natural my biggest complaint with skin of Marink is the runtime but even then having seen it twice since last year so three times in total i will be honest that even though the runtime annoys me i still feel time slipping away from me during the viewing i feel it very immersive kind of almost like a really good like spooky kind of ghost ride at a theme park. I kind of feel myself being drawn in even though I know the cheap tricks are going to be deployed. Even though I can kind of peek behind the curtain and see what's going to happen. It works and has an impact on me. It's not a movie that like a movie like Climax, for example, will occupy my brain for, for days. Gaspar Noe just has a shortcut right to... To, to my apprehension um, and, and general disbelief in humanity. Um, this doesn't have that effect on me, but for the hour and 40 minutes it runs, I am locked in and can't take my eyes away from it. Now, I've heard people say it is an absolute snore fest, it did not work on them, and I get that. If the conceit or scares in the movie do not work on you, 
then this is an experience which doesn't deliver frights, it delivers boredom. And I could never argue against anyone. Once again, these things are all subjective. But to me, I felt it was it was paced, maybe not as well as I would have paced it, but the delivery, execution, and originality to the movie as well worked. I've seen movies like this before where the idea of just weird noises and discombobulation didn't work for me. There's a kind of quasi-found footage movie called Yellow Brick Road from, what, 20, 2010 maybe? Maybe 2009, which I didn't like at all. I actually thought it was, was kind of awful. And a lot of the kind of weird sounds and disjointed nature of a whole section of that movie is what drew me out of it. And this movie's like a long form version of that in a lot of respects. But I think the premise is what grounds it for me and ultimately what won out. So yeah, if you didn't like Skin of Marink, what can I say? I, I wish that you had the experience that I had and I definitely wish that I didn't have the experience that you had. And number nine for me, Skin of Marink. And on to number eight. What is up, Spice Squad? The journey to Devil's Manor is finally here. We have got Chad Ryan. Better up, bitches. We got Spinifer. You can find all the products that we use today up in my bio, so go ahead and click that link. And they're all coming along with me for a little road trip to hell. Ah! <laughs> I actually couldn't see. Oh, good. You got that for me, that's fine. And number eight is Chad Gets the Axe. This is directed by Travis Bible, based on the story by Travis Bible and Kimmerton Hargrove. The synopsis is listed on IMDb as four social media influencers live stream their trip to Devil's Manor, former home to a satanic cult. So yeah, this one played at Fright Fest, ladies and gents. This is Chad Gets the Axe, another horror comedy. I mean, I can go easily on one hand and count the amount of horror comedies I enjoyed in the previous decade and now all of a sudden I've had what three? Three on my list so far for 2023. I genuinely found a lot of movies kind of hit that sweet spot of kind of earnest horror comedy. When I say earnest I mean as in it's earned its place not as in earnest like earnest does Christmas or earnest goes to jail or anything like that. Different earnest, although equally funny. Um, Chad Gets the Axe is, in a lot of respects, a kind of story we're seeing a lot more of. It's the idea of horror based around influencers and live streamers. Um, recent examples that didn't quite connect with me is Dashcam, which was made by the filmmaker that made The Host, went, became a viral sensation kind of overnight. He went on and did that Boogeyman movie, um, in, or Bogeyman, depending on how you're pronouncing it, uh, this year, which I found boring beyond all comprehension. Um, I found it like one of the most tedious experiences I've ever been through. Um, and he's kind of, he's a very well made movie, but just not for me. But I thought The Host was a really good movie. I thought he kind of stuck landing. I thought Dashcam was a really cool concept, just centred around easily one of the most annoying characters I've ever seen on screen. Um, last year, there was that movie by that couple whose name escapes me. They both directed and starred in a movie about a live streamer who was trying to rehabilitate his online presence by doing a kind of overnight stay in a haunt and its name escapes me and you're probably shouting at your devices, I do apologise, uh, my brain's a bit foggy today, but I thought that was excellent. This is kind of in the vein of that, um, but bigger. So it's like more cast, bigger story, more personalities, multiple live streamers, um, and it taps into a lot of kind of quirks and niches that exist specifically in live streaming today. So if you follow people on YouTube or TikTok or whatever, you've come across these people before. Um, they're all going to join forces together and spend a night in the Devil's Manor, which was, like it says in the synopsis, um, a house that housed a satanic ritual cult. And of course, as you can imagine, because the movie is the way the movie is, of all the places that they go to, wouldn't it just so happen that the haunt that they go to this time actually might be haunted. Um, I find that this movie stands up on repeat watches. Um, the characters are not supposed to be likeable and they aren't really likeable, but the shenanigans they get into it are very, very funny. The live stream comments on my second view and I spent more time reading them, absolutely amazing. Like some of, some of the funniest one-liners I've read in a horror comedy in, in quite some time or just in general a comedy about 
comments on the internet. Very, 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 very funny. I found the pacing worked wonderfully. It's about an hour and 20 minutes long and it doesn't over stay any particular scene and it kept me going to the end on subsequent viewings with other groups of people they've enjoyed it as well so it has that kind of appeal is it the most revolutionary movie i've seen no but three watches last year and i find it as funny on the third watch as i did on the first watch which is a big thing for me like comedies in general have diminishing returns on subsequent viewings for me but I found that I was laughing at bits that maybe didn't make me laugh the time before or finding a different angle to get in on it. If this is not your sort of horror movie then fair play but to me Chad Get the Axe is, uh, is a small indie horror comedy that done a whole hell of a lot right. Uh, like I say it played at Fright Fest, got a, a great ovation at uh, um, Fright Fest and the filmmakers seem really humble. Kind of looking forward to see what they do next. The movie's available on Amazon in the States. It's still to get a formal release in the UK, but I did get a screener for it when it came out in the States. It was very greedy to, to get my eyes back around it again. And it sticks up, holds up for me quite a bit. So at number eight for me is Chad Gets the Axe. Let's move on to number seven. Tiene una princesita de 24 semanas. <risa> Mire, ven, esta es su cabecita. Sí, sí. Ay, 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 sus piernas. ¿Y eso en medio? Su manito. Es su puño, ¿verdad? Sí. <risa> ¿De dónde? Ahí. Se está moviendo. Mira, mira, mira. Está. Vamos a medirle su cabecita. Wow. At number seven, Harusa, the Bone Woman. This one is directed by Michelle Garza Cervera, who also co wrote it along with Abia Castillo. The synopsis for this one is Valerie is dreaming about becoming a mother. After learning that she's pregnant, she expects to feel happy, yet something is off. Harusa the Bone Woman in at number 7. Another movie that early in the year was being touted as a if you see one movie this year, let it be Harusa the Bone Woman. It's now available via Shudder I believe. Um, I got a screener for it early in the year and I was curious. I was genuinely curious to see how this one was going to go. Um, I do go in with scepticism when everyone tells me it's the greatest horror movie of the year. Um, but it did have things running in its favour for me. One, it was South American and South America as a continent, I find their horror really gravitates to me, especially when it deals with religion or folklore. I think as a guy who is a general heathen and unbeliever in things of a spiritual nature, those things resonate to me in other cultures, uh, Japanese um, or, or South Asian horror movies that kind of lean into that idea of spirituality and folklore work really well for me. South America is pretty much the same. The kind of Anglo-European kind of Catholicism and exorcism and demonology doesn't have the same impact for me as it is dealt with in other, cult other cultures, for sure. Um, so I had that going for it to begin with. And then it was an idea of um, kind of folklore and pregnancy and you knew there was going to be a heavy amount of allegory in the movie and that's right up my geeky little neighbourhood. So I was curious to see how this one landed. I think Carissa the Bone Woman is grounded by incredible performances. Like I think the acting on this is some of the best that I saw in 2023. I think the story as well, I, I wouldn't claim to understand every single element in this movie. I would be a liar if I did that. Um, there is certainly open to translation things going on here or cultural stuff that's kind of worked its way through that just didn't quite connect with me the way that I kind of hoped it would. But that being said, I found some of this really, really creepy. Some of the, the the way it was constructed and delivered really, really, really worked for me. And I found the story just kind of awesome. Like that the idea of feeling like what you have inside you at a time when everyone expects you to be the happiest person on the planet 
makes you feel perturbed, disturbed, and generally disconnected is is a really fascinating subject. And I think on top of that as well, when you take into account that the movie across the board just went out its way to really deliver like a, a very strong sense of identity and story, it landed for me really, really, really well. I found myself thinking about this quite a bit after its, uh, after its runtime had completed and it kind of stuck with me throughout the year. I didn't get scared watching this one. I didn't even feel like the horror elements necessarily worked as well as I kind of hoped. I felt more apprehension than I did necessarily overt horror or terror. But sometimes the idea of apprehension itself can have a more negative impact over a longer period. Like a good like 20 minutes of this movie, I was just on edge. I wasn't scared, but I was just on edge that, uh, you know, the penny was about to drop and everything was going to go wrong. Um, I think this is a really, really, really well put together film. Like genuinely excellent. Just so self-assured. And from a relative newcomer to, to the genre, so... Curious to see where they go next. Curious to see what we get from them moving forward. I would love more kind of South American folklore um, in the movies. I genuinely love that. It's a personal a personal preference. But Harissa the Bone Woman was, was one of those like timeless watches. I think I could sit down and watch this movie 20 years from now and it will not date a like, iota at all. It just feels out of time, out of place. And as a result of that, just something that will hold up on uh, uh, on subsequent watches for the foreseeable future. Some movies that are on my list won't. I know for a fact that there are certain movies that I've either discussed already or will discuss later on are kind of like three years from now expect me to cringe. This is not one of those movies. So at number seven for me, the penultimate one in this video is Harusa, The Bone Woman, which means at number six and our final review of this episode... You better not cry after 20 seconds. What time it? Talk to me. Ellie, it's okay. Just say it. I'll let you in. <laughs> At number six, it's Talk To Me. It's written and directed by Danny and Michael Phila... Philippu? I think that's not how you pronounce that, but apologies. Synopsis for this one is listed on IMDb. When a group of friends discover how to conjure spirits using an abandoned hand, they become hooked on the new thrill until one of them goes too far and unleashes terrifying supernatural forces. Talk To Me is number six. It was an A24 movie, a studio that I love that has slowly moved away in the last two or three years into different interpretations of horror or different voices in horror. It's that, let's not use interpretations. Different voices in horror. It's a studio that was predominantly built on doing kind of more ethereal, esoteric, arty and abstract horror movies that are has now become a home for Ty West and his Mia Goth collaborations or Bodies, 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 which is a kind of fun, quirky, whodunit, murder mystery slasher comedy um, with you know a healthy bite of satire. And now Talk To Me, which is a movie which feels like a good old-fashioned possession you know, cursed item movie, you know, in the same veins to something like a little bit of an Evil Dead, and there are vibes of Evil Dead, Hellraiser, there's vibes of Drag Me to Hell through this movie, very Sam Raimi without the slapstick comedy. It borrows a lot, and this is probably why it's maybe not in my top five when it made a lot of other top fives for a lot of other people. It borrows a lot from other horror movies, so thematically and tonally it reminded me of a lot of other horror movies, never to the point where I felt it was whole right copied or even plagiarised. Um, rather, I felt that I kind of felt like I was on familiar ground. 
So much so that I kind of called the ending about half an hour into it and it was revealed and generally that's enough to make me kind of dislike a movie and that I feel like I have essentially exercised myself into a kind of monotonous cycle of tedium to be given the thing that I expect all the way through it. Um, this one delivered it, but I thought the way it delivered it, the journey I took to get there was worth it. And as a result, when it landed, there was a kind of sigh of, actually, that's a, the ending. I thought it was a really good ending. Looking at me, you know, great fucking non-storyteller. Uh, and so when it gave me it, I, I genuinely enjoyed that. I thought it was great performances. And at times, this movie is surprisingly dark and very shocking. Um, there is a scene where a possessed character essentially mutilates himself in a way which deeply got under my skin that kind of once again like movies like A24 have a want to do um, so I thought that was really 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 well done I felt the pacing was excellent and then the movie went on to do gangbusters for A24 overall I think because it was maybe aimed more at a mainstream audience where a movie like Midsommar or fucking The Lighthouse are never going to capture the mainstream um, this one managed to generate quite a bit of buzz and turn over a nice profit. Uh, there is a prequel in the works at the moment, which is kind of following the Ty West route. So we got X, then Peril, which was a prequel, and we're now getting Maxine. These guys are off doing the prequel just now, or I'd heard rumours that it might have been shot already. So they might do a trilogy as well, which is kind of interesting because A24 wasn't a studio known for sequels and now we're kind of getting sequels in the format of movies which maybe lean themselves to that like i can imagine like x getting a sequel i can imagine talk to me getting a sequel i cannot imagine green room getting a sequel for example uh, although I would imagine it would be pretty amazing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's that sort of thing. Uh, it was very well put together. It flows really, really well. Very, very, very good performances. And genuinely scary. So, you know, it gets cred for that. One of the few movies on my list that actually had one or two bits in it that not only unsettled but scared me. So, well done. Talk to me. Um, it's a great movie. I don't think if you are a hardcore horror fan, it's really going to revolutionise the way you look at the genre. But at the same time, I think it didn't really put a foot wrong. Which, in this day and age, how many movies can say that they didn't put a foot wrong through its entire runtime, especially dealing with a cynical audience that's seen it all before? You think about that one. So yeah, number six on my list was talk to me which means ladies and gents the official countdown from 10 through 6 goes a little like this at number 10 onyx the fortuitous and a talisman of souls at number 9 skinnamarink and number 8 chad gets the axe and number 7 it's harusa the bone woman which means at number 6 it was talk to me and there you go, that's the end of the episode. There is one more left to come, it's dropping on Wednesday and it'll give you my top 5 for 2023. And you could say, and I would agree, I've saved the best to last. If you've not heard a movie yet mentioned on the list, it may be in that 5, it may not be in that 5. But as always, I enjoy the dialogue. So let me know what you made of these movies. Did they connect, did they not connect? Is there any you're looking forward to seeing since I talked to? Any that you did watch that you know for a fact you will never watch again? Let me know on the comments on YouTube. If you're checking this out on YouTube, then please like, subscribe. It helps me and you get all the content when it drops. If you're checking this out on Spotify or Anchor, using the video podcast or just the audio features for the podcast over there, and there's always a question that pops up at the end of the episode. Please take a couple of seconds, answer that question. That would also be great. Make sure you subscribe there as well. And lastly, if you're one of the few in the proud that do the old school uh, podcast RA, SS feed through ever the platforms, the multitude of platforms that the show is available on, then hit subscribe over there as well. Uh, there is about 1300 episodes of the podcast under the stairs in podcast format, so you get access to them all at the touch of a button, and then you will always get every episode as and when they drop. So until Wednesday, when we wrap this series up, wherever you are, whatever the time zone is, and whatever you're up to in this big bad world of ours, please take care of yourselves out there. This is Duncan McLeish broadcasting live from under the stairs, and I am signing off.